So you've either got to be staggeringly ignorant, which most of them are, or if you're not ignorant, you've got to be insane. I mean, it's really a, a, a really appalling stranglehold that these archaic beliefs have on minds that have been warped since childhood. It's such a privilege to understand where we come from, a privilege that's granted to those of us who live after 1859, uh, that to deny children that privilege is wicked. Uh, it's um, a deprivation which should not be visited on any child when the truth is so staggeringly exciting. It really is an enormously exciting thought that we are cousins of all living creatures, that we have a history of four billion years of slow, gradual evolution. Just think about four billion years of slow, gradual history. That's not something we can easily take on board. But the effort of doing so is well worth it. It's such a, a beautiful thought that we are the heirs of four billion years of evil, maybe 3.5 billion years 
of evolution and that we are cousins of all living things. When you put that against the measly, piddling little ideas that are in Genesis, it's just no comparison. And it's a, a sad and diminishing deprivation of a child's opportunities to be denied that knowledge. Burn here. Yeah? If I were to give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin. Ahead of Newton, ahead of Einstein, he understood that what he was proposing was a truly revolutionary idea. The Darwinian revolution is about who we are, it's what we're made of, it's what our life means insofar as science can answer that question. So it, in many ways, was the singularly deepest and most discombobulating of all discoveries that science has ever made. Evolution is one of the most important ideas in the history of science. And unfortunately, most of what most people have heard about Charles Darwin and the discovery of evolution is completely wrong. Evolution is one of the most important ideas in the history of science. And unfortunately, most of what most people have heard about Charles Darwin and the discovery of evolution is completely wrong. It's such a privilege to understand where we come from, a privilege that's granted to those of us who live after 1859. Until Darwin published his Origin of Species in 1859, everyone thought the world was 6,000 years old, and that uh, a supernatural being had created every species uh, on the earth at one time. That's false. That is not true. That was not the state of scientific knowledge when Darwin came along. Those of us who live after 1859 the scientific community before Darwin, all religious men, not atheists, had already figured out of the preceding decades that the Earth is unbelievably ancient, countless millions of years. None of them accepted that it was 6,000 years old. These two points are universally accepted before Darwin. The world is unbelievably ancient, and the history of life on Earth has been a progressive story. Many people think Darwin just sailed to the Galapagos Islands. And when there, what happened? We had some sort of eureka moment when we saw the beaks of these finches and got the idea for evolution. That's completely wrong. Not only did Darwin not get the idea of evolution from the seeing these finches, but when he was on the Galapagos Islands, he didn't even know they were all finches.
there were loads of different kinds of birds. They vary a lot. It's only when he got home that an expert ornithologist told him that they were finches. So it was only when he got back to London and put all of the pieces together that he began to create his theory of evolution by branching descent. To find the clue to that, Darwin studied domestication. How is it that human breeders and farmers are able to create particular breeds with particular properties? was the singularly deepest and most discombobulating of all discoveries that science has ever made. And it's very often believed that when Darwin's book was published, there was a great public outcry, an outrage, there was a huge conflict with science and religion. Not really, but actually, the reaction was quite different than what most of us now think it was. Within 20 years of the publication of The Origin of Species, the scientific debate about evolution was over. Over. It was done. The international scientific community had accepted that evolution is true by the 1870s and moved on. He understood that what he was proposing was a truly revolutionary idea. So if you've heard, as I'm sure everyone listening to me has, that evolution is somehow controversial, uh, well no, it hasn't been since the 1870s. There are more recent controversies, but those have erupted in the 20th century. This is a new movement, not a, 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 a still ongoing uh, problem or debate or uh, question with Darwin ever since the beginning. It's a new movement, not a, 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 a still ongoing uh, problem or debate or, uh, or question with Darwin ever since the beginning. This is a new movement. 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 It seems to us unimaginable to tell the story of Darwin's life and not mention the Galapagos Islands. I mean, in, in modern stories, it's basically the pivotal moment. Darwin didn't have a eureka moment when he was in the Galapagos Islands. He didn't see the beaks of these finches and go, aha, evolution, and have a eureka moment. We know that didn't happen. Uh, in fact, it comes from around 1935, which was the centenary of Darwin's visit to the Galapagos. The, Dar the Galapagos was a famous place, and it was associated with Darwin because he had made most people familiar with it because of his beautiful account of his visit there. But what was not made was a connection between Darwin's visit to the Galapagos and discovering evolution. Nobody had done that before. But um, somebody made a little fudge here at the announcement of the meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in, in 1935, where they simply linked together, perhaps to set up the title of the session where this was discussed, that it was celebrating the centenary of the landing of Charles Darwin in the Galapagos and of the birth of the hypothesis of the origin of species. And thereby sort of accidentally linking these two ideas together. It could be misread or actually quite plainly read as if that was what was being celebrated, the birth of the origin of species on the spot in the Galapagos. And this is from the Times. And from this newspaper alone, it was reproduced in hundreds of other newspapers and magazines around the world. And from there on and on it went. In the same year, by wonderful coincidence, and at the same meeting, the term Darwin's finches was coined by an English uh, ornithologist, but not because he thought they were the origin of Darwin's theory, but he thought they were a particularly puzzling group of birds that he didn't, that no one at his time thought that natural selection could explain.
why should they be like this? They're a great puzzle, and Darwin uh, was the first to capture and describe these, so he named them after, after Darwin. But more famously, in 1947, this very important book by David Lack, called Darwin's Finches, really did crack the puzzle and showed that natural selection wasn't, was, the, was the explanation for why the finches were the way they were, and that the finches' beaks were a beautiful example of adaptive radiation. So nowadays, most people, when they tell the story of the finches and the Galapagos and Darwin, they're actually talking about what Lack found out, but attributing it to Darwin. So by the, by the mid-20th century, the myth that, that this great event had happened in the Galapagos was really solidifying, and you begin to find it everywhere. Here's a book from 1962, the heroic Darwin standing in the Galapagos, staring into the future, about to make a great discovery. Unfortunately, suffering from terrible hair loss for a 26-year-old. It seems impossible to represent Darwin as a young man. This is a, a scene from the BBC series The Voyage of Charles Darwin from 1978. Here's Darwin in the poop cabin of the Beagle, just leaving the Galapagos with his servant in the foreground. And in the desk in front of him, he has the Galapagos finches all lined up. And he's holding two in his hand and he's just saying, oh, look at this, Covington. See how their beaks all line up. Thus telling an audience of millions, that's how he did it. He just had to go to the Galapagos, line them up, and he got the idea. And of course, the, the, the finches have become absolutely synonymous with evolution. They've been on stamps and books and mugs, and it's, it's, it's endless. The next big legend or myth, which is Darwin's delay. Darwin comes up with this theory in the 1830s, the late 1830s. He doesn't publish it until 1858 or 1859. So there's a gap between those two dates of 20 years. Now, for, in recent decades, it's been very widely believed, almost universally believed, that Darwin, that this gap existed because Darwin was afraid to tell people what he believed, that he held it back, that he concealed it, uh, that he kept it a secret. In fact, this has now become, like the Finches, another one of these iconic things to say about Charles Darwin, that this is what his life was about. It was about concealment, fear, and secrecy. This is the homepage of the American Museum of Natural History's wonderful Darwin exhibition. Uh, but what do they say in this particular page about Darwin? For 21 years, he kept this theory secret. Similarly, the Natural History Museum in London, this is the image they've chosen for Darwin. Don't tell anyone, I believe in evolution. Okay, this is the first page of The Origin of Species, published in 1859. What did Darwin tell his readers? He says, on the first page, after I came home from the voyage of the Beagle, in 1837, I began working on this subject. And then I, I, I put together a sketch in 1842, and in 1844, a longer sketch. And from that period to the present day, I have steadily pursued the same object. That's what Darwin told his readers on the first page of The Ocean of Species. I was working on it. I'm still working on it. That was Darwin's published official statement. There is nowhere any evidence of holding back, delaying, or fear of the reaction against his own theory. Now this is a diagram from the Reverend Buckland's Bridgewater Treatise from 1837. That is just when Darwin got back from the Beagle Voyage. And what this depicts is the state of the art knowledge of the day. And what this shows us today is that no one, no scientist in Darwin's day believed that the world was 6,000 years old. That was utterly antiquated. They all knew the Earth was really, really old. They didn't know how old it was, they had no way of dating it, but they, they, they knew absolutely it was incredibly old. And they knew that it was filled, filled with countless eras of previous life, and that these rock, rocks were the same where everyone went in the world. And the fossils are represented on the top of the diagram, and the amazing thing was that they were always arranged in a progressive series. That the more ancient rocks contained more primitive forms of life, and as one moved up through the geological time, more complex, as they called them, creatures emerged. First there were fish, first there were shells, then there were fish, then there were amphibians, then there were reptiles, then there were mammals, but of extinct types that no one had ever seen. And only in the most recent rocks were there mammals of types resembling, or indeed the same, as any alive today. But nowhere in all of that had anyone ever found a human fossil. So they knew that this countless eras of life that existed on the Earth before, before now, 
were worlds without human beings in them. That was the state of knowledge in Darwin's day. That was universally accepted in the scientific community. All of these orthodox Christian scientists, all of these orthodox Christian scientists, all of these orthodox Christian scientists, he was not an atheist. He had given up his belief in Christianity, but he had not given up his belief that some intelligent thing may have started up nature in the first place.
the OM equal age interpretation of Genesis along with its evolutionary development of life continued to be noted and taught throughout Middle Eastern religious culture across the millennia of time, right up until Charles Darwin's day. 300 years after the text of the Wisdom of Solomon was penned, the New Testament repeated the Yom equal age interpretation of Genesis in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8, where the author states, Beloved be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Around 700 AD, the text of King David from Psalms stating that there were 974 generations of humanity before Adam was recorded in the Jewish Talmud, along with commentary by medieval Jewish scholars. Chajita 13, b, states, Behold, a storm of the Lord is gone forth in fury, yea, a whirling storm, it shall whirl upon the head of the wicked. But our Ahabi Jacob said, For it is said, and pressed forward before their time, whose foundation was poured out as a stream. It is taught, our Simeon the pious said, these are the 974 generations who pressed themselves forward to be created. According to the rabbinic interpretation of Psalms the divine plan originally envisaged the creation of a thousand generations prior to the giving of the Torah, but foreseeing their wickedness, God held back 974 generations and gave the Torah at the end of 26 generations. As Christian Europe was driven into the Dark Ages under the Theodosius Codex and the Roman Papacy, Islam free from the imperial decrees of the Vatican continued to develop evolution into a fully modern science. There were several Muslim scholars and scientists who had made the same observations Darwin eventually published in the domain of the British Empire, but they had made these observations, not decades or even centuries, but millennia, before Charles Darwin. The most famous among them was the Islamic scientist, Ibn Khaldun, who wrote in 1337 AD. Quote, it started out from the minerals and progressed in an ingenious gradual manner to plants and animals. The last stage of minerals is connected with the first stage of plants, such as herbs and seedless plants. The last stage of plants such as palms and vines is connected with the first stage of animals. The animal world then widens, its species become numerous, and in a gradual process of creation, it finally leads to man, who is able to think and reflect. The higher stage of man is reached from the world of apes, in which both sagacity and perception are found, end quote. That was written 500 years before Charles Darwin in England. And it was through the Islamic conquest of Western Europe that the knowledge of evolution was brought to Western Europe and ultimately to Charles Darwin himself, which was historically, the real actual intellectual origin of Darwin's work. How do we know this to be the fact? Because Sir William Draper, a contemporary evolutionist with Charles Darwin wrote a very famous book, which atheists such as Richard Dawkins, love to cite as proof of a conflict between science and religion during this time. In fact, it was titled History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. But what atheists such as Richard Dawkins never bother to tell the public, is that in this very same book, Sir William Draper refers to the theory of evolution as it was known prior to the creation of the Darwin myth. And he openly cites its historical source by calling it the Mohammedan theory of the evolution of man from lower life forms. He openly cites its admitted Islamic origins in Western Europe, in print. So you see, atheism had nothing to do with the development of the modern theory of evolution, and contrary to what they have incessantly told the public, evolution had everything to do with Genesis, from its earliest times in Western Europe. In fact, almost exactly opposite to what the public has been led to believe through disinformation, atheism actually did exist in the ancient world, and atheism rejected evolution as a quote, creation myth, end quote. Classical atheism taught that there was nothing beyond the visible sensory world, and that the universe along with its people had always been here. Nothing was created at all, thus evolution explaining the origin of life, proposed by ancient theists, was completely rejected. Evolution does not philosophically support classical atheism, in fact, it outright contradicts it. Evolution, proposed by theists from Genesis, 
supports a theistic worldview, theists, who believe they had received the knowledge of it originally as a revelation not of science, but from the Creator, who gave it to them, not as a repudiation of his existence, but as a confirmation of his wisdom in bringing the world into its present state. It is in fact atheism, not theism, which has an archaic belief system that has been completely disproven by modern science.